<laughs> Hi guys, you are tuning in to Daisha Shaquila and I am in the middle of nature and I felt so relaxed and so serene and I decided that I would like to tell my story. Uh, I want to bring awareness to what it's like for a child to be in foster care. I was a foster kid and there's a lot that goes into it and I don't think people fully understand that. And as foster kids get older, there is something that only other foster kids can relate to. To start the story off, I wanna say I don't know exactly how um, me and my sister came to be in foster care. Now, I do know a little bit um, according to what the family and others have told us. Now, when I was about two years old, my mom took me and my sister to my uncle's girlfriend house and um she just never came back and i guess my uncle was like out doing his thing too so the girlfriend she called social services social services they got there um well let me back up so girlfriend calls social services then my uncle finds out that you know she called social services you know and as i said he was like drinking and stuff too i guess from what people have said he was drinking and stuff too um and then <laughs> i thought something was crawling on my leg so then um i guess him and her they get into like this big fight and the cops get called and stuff like that so when the social workers found out that you know the cops had been called the moms on drugs nobody in the family uh could take us i have a lot of aunts and uncles but uh apparently nobody was like in a good position to take on two little girls um so like that's when we entered our first foster home so I was around two years old and um we went to we went to a few foster homes I remember one lady she used to like lock us in the closet when we were bad she used to put us in the closet in the dark and put hot sauce on our fingers I honestly don't know what the hot sauce was for but uh, she used to lock us in the closet and um put hot sauce on us uh, on our hands to this day, I'm severely claustrophobic. I do not like elevators. I do not like being in closed rooms. Like, I freak out. I literally have a panic attack. When I had my um, my son, they I had a C-section because he was like a really fat baby. And I literally walked down the stairs to go pay um, the circumcision because the nurse was like, oh, you need to walk, you need to walk. I was like, not a problem. Uh, but she wanted me to walk the hall. <laughs> she didn't want me to like walk all the way down some stairs, you know, just after having a major surgery. But it's like, even in the fifth grade, I, th I walked to the top of like the police chief building because I was like so afraid of elevators. Like I just don't like closed shit. Like don't, no more locked doors, like kind of thing. Um, but anyway, so after we stayed with all these random strange people some good some not so good uh my aunt stepped in i'm sorry i just heard something <laughs> so my aunt stepped in and she says you know i'm gonna take them and we were delighted we were excited we couldn't believe like somebody actually wanted us and that we you know we're gonna be taken out of foster care ended up adopting us um, and we had a good life with her 
uh, we barely saw our mom um, so we didn't see her a lot at all um, but it got to the point where um, she started to get sick at first it started with like a stroke and then a heart attack and she was like really obese like she was really big uh, so I think that kind of contributed to a lot of her health issues um, but yeah when she started to get sick it like went really downhill before that it had started going downhill because she had a son and he was like on drugs real bad at the time and he used to molest and uh, rape my sister um, and her my aunt her way of like dealing with it to keep us safe was to have us lock ourselves in a bedroom so we had to lock ourselves in the um in our room at night thank goodness we never had a fire but uh we did have to lock ourselves like uh those little key locks we had to put it on the door lock it uh just to try to keep ourselves safe uh because she didn't feel comfortable putting her son out yeah so once she started to get sick we started having to like go stay with people um, she couldn't work so she depended on uh, food stamps and uh, checks eventually she started to get a check for us I think it was child support I'm not really sure uh, but she did receive a check for us and that kind of helped make ends meet now we didn't get that money at all so I mean but we didn't get it directly but you know she used it to pay the bills and she used it to just try to make ends meet since she wasn't working uh, she didn't she wasn't old enough to get retirement at this point now that I'm older looking back on it she wasn't old enough to get retirement so I'm not really sure if she got a disability or what was happening but she was definitely um, struggling to kind of take care of us and we were around I want to say we were around like 9, 10, 11. Uh, I think around like 12, we were taken. Uh, I came home from school. No, I came home from Durham Scholars. So I was about 12 years old and I had got uh, inducted into this program for at-risk youth and when I got home, we always went to Durham Scholars. So Durham Scholars would probably get out about 5.30. And once I got out of there, ooh, it's a bug, I'm sorry. I'm at a nature park, but kinda caught me by surprise. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so we got home from school. There was a worker waiting for me and my sister and she told us that we were going to a new family. So once we got there, she was like, you know, just pack some clothes for the night. You don't need a lot of stuff, just, you know, something to last you for the week. So at this point, we were like, something sketchy here, but we really didn't have a choice, so we packed for a week. Um, but we were kind of under the understanding that we would be coming back, like at no point, did we not think we were coming back? So, we packed our clothes and, oh, my camera's kinda out of focus. Okay, so we packed our clothes. We fully thought we were coming back. Um, so, yeah, uh, but she took us down to social, the social services, child services building. And when we got there, that's when they told us that you're not going back. She's getting, um, she gave up rights to us. Uh, she didn't feel like she could be a good care provider as far as um, parenting or guardianship goes. So we would never be going back. Now, 
that's like like that is something that's really tough to hear for us especially since that was like our only connection to family so we had no other familial connection like we wasn't close to my mom's side and we wasn't close to my dad's side and like my mom's side I guess we knew them because of my aunt but without my aunt we didn't know them and so at this time I guess nobody in the family was able to like step in and help us out or um like take custody if you will so <laughs> we had no idea like what happens next where were we going and we sat in that social services building all day um I guess they had no idea. <laughs> they had no idea where we were going. They had no idea if they were gonna keep us together, if they were gonna split us up. Like they really had no idea. So I wanna say um, about seven hours later, that's when we found out that uh, they were gonna split us up and that we would be going to separate foster homes. So I went to go stay with this uh, Caucasian lady and she was nice. Like I had no complaints there. Uh, but to, to be a black girl and go stay in a Caucasian household, it makes you feel like you feel so out of place and she was nice and she had a beautiful house and it had a pool and stuff like that so I really did appreciate that it was nice she was a nice lady she had a pool um, it was cool I really didn't have any complaints or anything I just felt out of place being a black girl in a white household um, then uh, we stayed there about a week. We constantly changed homes, and I ended up going to go stay with a lady, a family called the Clarks. Now that was like my my best foster care home. Like they were dope. Like they threw block parties for back to school to make sure all the kids on that street and in that neighborhood had somewhere to go. Ziggy. Um, Y'all go play on the other side. Um, they do block parties to make sure all the kids had uh, back to school supplies. Uh, just, you know, just make sure they help take care of the community. So these were like really good people. You know, they took me shopping for the first time. I think that's when like Boo Boo Hat came out. I was like <laughs> a kid in a candy store. Um, so I stayed with them for about a year. And that's when the aunt that I told you guys about in the beginning, um, the one that had originally called child services on my mom for not, um, I guess, coming to get us. Um, I call her my aunt, but she wasn't really my aunt because her and my uncle never got married. But um, yeah, so that's when she came back in the future. Now, she decided to take me out of this home and I was gonna go stay with her. And I thought this was awesome. Like, I was like, you know, I can't believe, you know, somebody finally in the family or that felt close to family wants me. By this time, my sister, she had ran away. She was on her own journey. Uh, so I really didn't know what was going on after they had split us up. Um, so I ended up going to go stay with my aunt. But there was like a lot of confusion and she thought I was doing a lot more than I, I was doing. And I guess I could have told her like, hey, I'm not doing these things, you know. But everything she accused me of, I kindly just admitted to it because I felt like that's what she wanted to believe. And I don't know, it was just a lot. So. I 
it did work out. I stayed with her for about a year and a half, probably not even that. Uh, but she called child services on me and she had them come pick me up one day out after school. And of course I was like devastated. Like how could she do this to me? Uh, but she ended up sending me to a place that we call Central Children's Home. And in Central Children's Home, it was like an orphanage in Oxford. So that's pretty much where I spent the rest of my years. <laughs> until I was about 16, 15, almost about to be 16. Once I turned 15, another, my uncle and his wife at the time, another different uncle said, hey, you know, we want her to come stay with us. Now I was happy about this because I, I, I didn't want to be in an orphanage. I don't think anybody wants to be in an orphanage and in the orphanage, it's kind of like you get a, a, an allowance, but you have to go to bed at a certain time. You have to do so many things at a certain time. Um, so, and so many kids, they get to go home on the weekend and you feel so left out because you don't get to go home on the weekend because nobody wants you. So when you're in that orphanage, the main goal is to like, get a home visit go home on the weekend like the kids that go home on the weekend all the other kids you're kind of just sitting there like I wish that was me sorry guys I get teary eyed when I talk about some of this but um you want to be the kid to go home on the weekend so finding out that my uncle and his girlfriend you know they were gonna take me I was like hell Yes, I'm ready to go, that's that. Of course, I was gonna miss my friends. So I took a bunch of pictures with some of the girls in my cottage because they had age group cottages, like from this age to this age, the young girls, and then you had the teenage girls and then the teenage boys. And it was kind of like a, co a college campus, if you will. Um, and I had really bonded with a lot of the, what do you call them? Leaders, house leaders, house moms. Um, so that was pretty cool there. I think when I left, it was more so just sheer excitement. I couldn't believe it. I felt like I had hit the jackpot. Like, Wee, we going home. Um, and then they had a daughter. I'm not going to say her name. Cause I don't want no confusion. But anyway, so they had a daughter and she would just like wear my clothes, like have her whole period in the clothes, like, and then fold it up and put it back in the drawer. And that was like, you nasty little. <laughs> and, uh, and she would like wear my shoes and my shoes were like a size six and her feet was like a size 10. And she would like totally wear my shoes. And I'd be like, yo, like I would tell her mom, like she's wearing my shoes, she stretched them out and everybody, that was like the time the Air Forces had came out. I had a little side hustle kind of the job. Um, and I was like so bothered <laughs> because, you know, growing up as a foster kid, you kind of just, your stuff is your stuff. And you don't have a lot of stuff to hang on to. So when you get something, you're like, hmm. You're holding on for dear life. <laughs> so experiencing that and being able to, you know, I was trying to, you know, use my words because by this time I had a whole lot of therapy. <laughs> uh, trying to use my words and telling her mom and her mom was just like, oh well. I was like, uh oh, okay. So that taught me that you can do whatever you want to do and there's no consequences for your actions. So I was like, okay, okay, I like this, I like this. So I decided one day, she had just got a child support check and she had all these nice clothes and all this stuff and I was like, <laughs> I'm a genius. I took all those new clothes, I bleached them. One by one, just bleachy, 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 bleachy. And first off, I'm a country girl. So we, we burn our trash. 
So I had the bright idea. I was gonna burn all the stuff I didn't, you know, all the stuff that I didn't bleach. I'm just set it on a nice little controlled fire in the backyard, which I really do know how to burn trash in a controlled environment as not to cause, you know, danger to anything else. So I did that. They had went to the store or something. I did all of this while they were gone. When they came back and they saw that, she was so pissed. She was like, you are Satan. You know, you ain't nothing but the devil. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Like she had had a whole, a whole lot of enough. Um, and I, I was like, why are you shocked? You know, your child did all this stuff to me. Like all this stuff to me, but you're mad at me. So once again, they call child services and back to foster care I go. So I went to another um, group home, but this was like different, it was like a house. And it was like for kids, um, teenagers, but it was co-ed. So you had like girls and boys in like a house type group home. And I was like, whoa, okay, I had never been here before. While I was in that group home, it wasn't the worst. But I, there were some instances where you just, again, other kids go home on the weekend and you're like, you know, <laughs> I done pissed off the people that even thought about allowing me to come over. So I know, you know, I'm not going anywhere for the holidays. I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm kind of stuck here. But there was one instructor. She could not cook to save her life. So she made some spaghetti and she put sugar in it. And I don't like sugar spaghetti. I hate sugar spaghetti. I just don't believe sugar should be put in spaghetti. It's spaghetti. Okay, I had to check up on my babies. <laughs> but yeah, so she put sugar in a spaghetti. Then she tried to put like some little cheese blends on it. It was a hot mess. Um, and she was like, eat this. And I was like, no. I'm not eating it, never gonna eat it. I tasted it, it was bad. I was like, I'm done, I'm done. Stick a fork in me. Um, and she was like, either you're gonna eat it or you're gonna wear it. Me, being the person I am, I'm like, she can't touch me. You know, I can choose not to eat the food. I don't like the food. I feel like it's gonna make me sick. I'm not gonna eat the food. So she took that it was a glass plate she took that glass plate and she just slammed it in my face my nose start bleeding it was like i one i couldn't believe she had did it two i think my feelings was hurt more than anything out of this whole little thing my feelings was just hurt so what i did i um I kind of just went up to my room and cried. And once the director and everybody found out what had happened, they went into full on damage control, trying to make it right. Of course, she got fired. Um, they had her issue me an apology and they had some gifts and stuff sent, but I think they just didn't want it to get out because had I told anybody, like as far as like social workers or something like that, you know they could have lost their license and you know it would have been shut down so full-on damage control mode at this point I'm like all right you know it's cool I'm not gonna say anything a few months go past you know by this time I'm 17 the limit for this particular group home was 17 years old after 17 you could no longer be in a group home so they start searching and searching and searching and searching for somewhere to um, for me to go for my 18th birthday because when you turn 18 they kick you out most kids when they turn 18 you know they just graduated from high school you know they're going off to college stuff like that but for me my birthday is late my birthday is in October so it I didn't graduate when I was 17. I kind of would graduate when I was 18. Um, so that by this time they found this lady, they found another foster mom uh, for me to go to. And complete stranger, 
and she was supposed to like you know keep me until I was able to like stand on my own two feet so I went to I was still in high school I went to go stay with her and I remember I was a cheerleader she knew I was a cheerleader I remember getting home from chili in practice I had like she was supposed to pick me up she never came to pick me up I don't think she wanted an older child like anyway so me going to, to stay with her she thought she was getting like a baby and then here she is with a 17 year old like when school was out like for a break it's like Labor Day or something like that school was out she would literally come home and search the entire house like I had somebody in the house like I didn't have anybody in the house by this time I'm like you know I don't have a lot of options here so I'm gonna be on my best behavior um, so she comes through and checks the house. I went to cheerleading practice after school. So school got out, I went straight to cheerleading practice. And when cheerleading practice ended, I'm waiting for her, waiting for her, waiting for her. Like, she never comes. It's like six, six something, 6.30 at night, and she's still not there. So um, one of my cheerleader, cheerleader friends, um, co-cheers, uh, she was like, you know, do you need a ride home? I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll stay right down the street. They took me to her house. When I got to the house, all of my belongings, my clothes, my shoes, everything was sitting out on the curb. And I'm like, what, what did I do? You know, I really didn't do anything, you know? And um, I think this is... Hold on. So, try not to cry here. I ended up, like, I was so embarrassed. Let me just say that I was, one, embarrassed. Two, my mom was like, I don't have anywhere to go. Like, I don't know what to do. Um, so she called the social worker. The social worker comes out. The social worker tells me that she says I stayed out. I intentionally didn't come home. So I'm like, I was at truly in practice. And of course my friend and her mom, they're still there, you know, and um, they're like, yeah, she really did just come. They vouched for me and everything. So I'm thinking everything's gonna be okay when she found out I was just at truly in practice. But she was like, no, she's been sneaking around. Da, da, da. But I swear to you, I was like, I was like a saint. I was not doing anything. Um, so, the social worker came, she picked me up, and she was like, you know, we have nowhere for you to go, so we're gonna take you back to the orphanage. I didn't wanna go back to the orphanage, but I was like, okay. So then I met this lady, and her name was Miss Laverne. Now, I call her Aunt Vern because her sister has kids by one of my uncles. I have a lot of uncles. My grandma, my granddaddy, they was getting it in, so I have a lot of uncles. But um, she stepped in and she was like, you know, I'm not gonna let you go back to Oxford, come stay with me. When I tell y'all, like to this day, I will forever love her for that. Because like that really meant so much to me. And at this point I had no idea like what was about to happen in my life. Like. I was not ready to be on my own. I was not ready for anything that was like going to come after this. Um, so I went to go stay with her and she had a daughter named Tiffany and you know my cousin Tasha was there whatever. That's my son. <laughs> He's like mommy hurry it up. But um, yes. So I went to go stay with them and that's where I kind of like stayed at and then you know kind of went off to college and everybody tells you like go off to college get out of the state you know so I went to Virginia State and it was a disaster school closes during the holidays so it was a struggle to try to like get back to Durham and stuff like that and um when I came back to Durham on the holidays I remember I had got like a refund check and I was supposed to help um, the family. But I was like, you know, I need stuff in my dorm room. So I kind of kept the money and I didn't do what I was supposed to do. So um, Miss 
Laverne, her grandma was like, well, her mom was like, you know, you can't come back here during the holidays no more. So I was like, you know, by this time I'm 18, I'm like, it's okay, it's cool. You know, I my sister, she had, was like dating a dude and he had his own place. So I was like, you know, I'll just go stay there and um, stuff like that. Of course, it was a struggle because when he would get mad at her, uh, he would get mad at me. When he would kick her out, he would kick me out. It was just a disaster. Stop dipping those toys in the um, water. Stop dipping toys in the water. Stop, did that. Stop dipping toys in the water. <laughs> yes, so anyway. That was like my from two to 18 foster care story. Of course, you know, my life isn't over, but I don't, I think growing up in foster care, I have a tendency to try to hold on to people and relationships. Like when you're in a relationship and it's just not working out, you so don't want to give up because you're so scared this person is gonna like leave you and you don't want that person to leave you. So I have a tendency to hold on to people. But I also have a tendency to not get attached. So it takes me a long time to get attached to people. But when I'm attached, it's like, I don't want to let go. I don't want to let go. You know, it's kind of like that. Um, but I'm very good at detaching. For the most, like, I'm very good at detaching from people and situations. And uh, people are like, you're kind of... You're kind of standoffish, or you're kind of this, and you're kind of that, and it's like, I don't know sometimes how to be like that, mm, that, that girl's like, hey girl, how you doing? Give me hugs. Oh my God. Like, I'm really to myself, like outside of my kids. I love my kids, but that's probably about it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I love my family and stuff too, but I don't know. It's like when you've gone through foster care and like nothing is ever permanent. So you try not, you learn, not try, you learn how not to get attached to people, how not to get attached to things, how not, you just so detached. Like somebody could really like something happened to them and you're like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, he got shot. Okay. It's kind of like that. Um, I reconnected. When I got pregnant with my daughter, I reconnected with my mom and start developing a relationship with her. So now she babysits sometimes. Now she still has a drinking problem, but she will still, you know, babysit and stuff like that. Yes. Be careful for people. Um, yeah, so I reconnected with my mom and I reconnected with my dad like last year kind of met him and talked with him and you know it was what it was but um that's my foster care story i'm sorry this is such a long video i just wanted to like tell my story to get i'm gonna include some pictures and stuff at the end just to you know let y'all know it's real this is like a true life real story um and I hope that I inspired somebody. I hope that somebody is inspired to tell their story. I hope somebody can feel where I was coming from. And I hope, you know, my kids look back at this video and it's like, you know, mommy really did her thing because now the challenge is to be the parent to my kids that I never had. Just kind of, you know, be a good person in this world to give them the life I never had so give them the experiences that I never had like that's my main goal is just to be a good mom but I never learned how to be that so I'm like really trial and error here Like I was not raised in a household I don't I didn't have a mom to teach me how to cook I didn't have all these things like the first time I fried chicken I washed it and it bled and I didn't know chicken was supposed to bleed so I threw all the chicken away as because I was frying it and when I put it in the frying pan it started bleeding so I threw it all away because I thought I didn't wash it right so <laughs> when you are a foster child you kind of go to a cafeteria or you have a house mom or you have stuff like that so you don't really do a lot of stuff for yourself you have to learn that over time so yeah 
I hope you guys found this inspiring. Have a great day. My kids are like, mommy, we need to wrap this up. We need some water. So let me go. Oh, and a butterfly just landed on my camera. Did y'all see it? Oh my gosh. Okay.